Well, let's bring in a guest now to talk about one particular pocket of the cryptocurrency space, and that is the NFT video game world. Indeed, we have Don Stepanidis, who is the CEO of Baltazar. Baltazar is an NFT gaming platform, and uh, John is joining us today from Sydney. Thank you very much for your time. You know, it's a very interesting and a very new space as well. A lot of people still say, look, it's a space I don't understand, so therefore I'm not going to wade into it or even invest in it. But uh, what we're also hearing is that increasingly people are quitting their day jobs and, uh, and joining NFT gaming platforms to try and earn a living, particularly in countries like the Philippines, which has a very high NFT uptake. Tell us how NFTs are disrupting the video game world and is playing to earn a risky space to be in. Awesome, great to be here, guys, and uh, you know, happy to answer your question around NFTs. So, let's start with um, let's start with the play to earn space in, in developing countries such as the Philippines, such as in other countries like India and even South America. The reason it's having such a massive impact is because somebody can play a game for an hour a day and earn about ten US dollars from playing that game for an hour, which equates to more than the minimum monthly wage, you know, in the Philippines. So, for example, if the minimum monthly wage in the Philippines is two hundred US dollars and they're making ten US dollars a day. It's a great value proposition for just playing you know, one hour of gaming a day. So it's having a huge impact you know, economically. But we have to look at it uh, in a slightly more detailed level and understand the mechanics around these games and how it works. So the idea of buying an asset in a game you know, and, and playing with that asset is not necessarily new. I mean, people have been playing in Candy Crush for years. People spend money on you know, uh, FIFA packs like myself, for example. We now bought you know, lots of FIFA packs over the years. Um, but the problem is, those assets usually expire and you get no value out of them. So that's where this idea of NFT comes in. So obviously an NFT being a non-fungible token is a unique contract that represents digital ownership of something. So if I'm buying a digital asset and I have a contract that says I own this asset, that's adding a lot more value to the user. So gaming companies, games like Axie Infinity, which is the game that's on my t-shirt under the Balthazar logo, they're creating these games where people can buy assets and earn with those assets. And that's what we're seeing in the Philippines. And it's important to understand that you know, these assets can be quite expensive. So that's where guilds and platforms like ourselves come through and we can purchase the assets for them, for example, three to $400, and allow them to play to earn a yield. So that's how the market's sort of shifting and how uh, game structure is shifting. Understood. So Balthazar is essentially lowering the barrier to entry for these people who want to play to earn. If we try to work out just how sustainable the NFT market is, particularly in the video game world, John, we always try to see what, 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 is, the, what, is, the, what is the uptake, what is the mainstream adoption. And I'm, I'm hearing that nearly half of all UK and US game developers are now incorporating NFTs into their games. Is this a trend that you see as, just de as increasing over time? Absolutely, and as game quality starts to get better, so obviously the game quality of these play-to-own games, you know, it's still quite a new space, so it's not quite up to scratch with your, your mainstream sort of non-play-to-own games. But as the game quality you know increases, these gaming companies are going to be challenged because, as I said, there's a lot more value being transferred to the gamer because they now have an asset that they own that could potentially some value, right? So they're going to start thinking, well, I need to come into the play-to-own space and I need to be able to add this value to my users. Otherwise, we're going to see a huge shift. And to get into the numbers, I mean, the gaming industry is valued just under $200 billion at about $170 billion. And the NFT gaming industry, in a very short period of time, is already worth $10 billion. So the answer is, yeah, we're starting to see games, companies like Ubisoft coming out and registering their interests um, and really you know, driving this forward alongside you know, other gaming companies, like, for example, Animoca Brands were involved in you know, the play to own space. So it's interesting how we're seeing sort of traditional gaming companies crossing over with sort of NFT gaming companies and this buzzword that we hear about called the metaverse and understand how that's going to cross over and drive the, the industry forward in general. Uh, John, thank you for joining this conversation. Everybody's trying to wrap their heads around you know, how the future would evolve uh, for, for NFTs as well as uh, these uh, gaming companies that are incorporating NFTs uh, within the gaming model. Um, what's the risk out here as this market grows? How do you think about it? Look, absolutely. With cryptocurrency, I think there's always a risk, and we can see the volatility in the market in general, and obviously there's, there's no financial advice or anything here, I'll just preface it by saying that. But in terms of just general financial risks, you know, it's, it's important to recognize that cryptocurrency is quite volatile, and it's not like earning you know, US or Australian dollars or you know, Filipino peso. But I think what's important to recognize is that a lot of the Filipino you know, people and the Indian people are earning a currency that's not necessarily tied to their local economy. 
So if their local economy is inflated, they don't have to be tied into that. So there's a huge benefit there. But look, the risks, you know, there's definitely cryptocurrency volatility, and there's obviously security risks as well around password storage, because you know, obviously with cryptocurrency, you know, especially when it's decentralized, you know, and we're not talking about a centralized exchange, nobody's accountable. You're accountable for the, for the money that you're making. So you can't go to the bank and call them up and say, hey, I lost my money. So it's really important to have a password management system, something like LastPass or OnePassword, to store your private keys, you know, which can be used to access the wallets and any of your passwords. So there's obviously a financial risk and there's, you know, there's a risk in terms of data, but they can all be managed just like any other industry. And you don't see risk on the regulatory front, uh, you don't see risk from government's authorities, because what you're saying is more and more people adopt this model, right? That would come at the compromise of productivity gains going into the economy directly. So you're kind of, you know, choosing a path where you're delinking yourself from, from the formal economy, from the formalized economy. But, you know, a lot of people might quit their jobs, their regular jobs, and go into just plain to earn, uh, because that seems like an e easier model. And so wouldn't that be a threat to the traditional system that, as we understand it? And wouldn't governments and the regulators have a problem? That's a fantastic question. Um, and I think there's there's two parts to answering that. I think I think regulation is good and I, I think that it helps create a structure for cryptocurrency in general. And you know, I think people pay their taxes and you know the money goes to the right places. What what I will also say is a lot of the gaming companies that we're seeing are actually based in Southeast Asia. So that we have you know gaming companies based in Vietnam, gaming companies based in Hong Kong. So what we're actually seeing is it's it's more of a shift. It's you know, even if they're playing as NFT games. You know, you've got institutions and funds investing heaps of money into these companies that are based in Southeast Asia already. So it's not like money is going you know, to Western countries or other countries. It's just shifting to a different format. So the way that these economies could thrive has been, is being transformed. So I, I see it as a positive thing, and I also see regulation as a positive thing for the industry. Indeed, regulation is often a very positive thing for the sustainability of any industry, right? It also means that we can ring-fence the risk, or at least try to. What does it mean for an investor? If you're someone who says, look, I missed out on uh, getting in on the crypto craze early in, the, in, early in the piece, and I've got massive FOMO, but perhaps NFTs is my chance. What would you advise an investor to do, and where should they be investing that is hopefully not going to also let them lose their shirt? I guess that's sort of be clear, like from my perspective, like, there's no sort of official financial advice given or anything like that. Um, but, but I think in general with the NFT space, um, the variety of businesses is increasing, right? So now you've got games, now you've got, you know, guilds and communities, you've got different platforms. So what that means is you're getting talent that comes from traditional Web 2.0 businesses, different tech companies that are now moving over and using cryptocurrency technology, using this Web 3.0 base to actually innovate and develop. So what that means is there's a whole, you know, there's a whole opportunity of new investments, you know, in the NFT space. Now, I don't know, I, I'm not sure you need to give you particular companies, but there's a lot of opportunities out there that people should be looking out for and assessing the teams that are running, you know, these platforms. So it's, it's, it's shifted, it's legitimizing the space, in my opinion, you know, in, in a great way, and shifting from sort of this shady sort of, uh, you know, what was it once, once considered sort of a little bit shady into something that's now really legitimate and innovative, right? So we're starting to see it really progress forward. Sure. Lovely to have you on the show, John. Thank you very much uh, for joining us and weighing in on the subject. It's a long one. Like I said, uh, we're still on the learning curve. Let's see how things evolve.